Hey, good morning. morning. Hey, thanks, Eric. Um, There is a lot going on campus right now, and so I'm not able to announce everything, but please check out No Hope um, to discover things going on for Asian Awareness Week, um, for the Women's Sexual Health Fair. Um, Tonight at 8 o'clock, the Gospel Choir invites you here to Dimnet to come and worship with them. There will be food. And also, today is the last day to turn in your application for small, women's small group Bible study leaders, so do that today. We are traveling through the season of Lent, and as we have done that as a community, as we are doing that as a community, we've been talking about spiritual disciplines. And we're reminded that disciplines help us do two things. They help us remember and see who God is, and thus who we are, we are not God, and they help us to pay attention. This morning we're going to look at a story that would have been familiar to the Christians in Colossae, who are, we've been looking at the book of Colossians, and maybe familiar to you as well. And as we hear this story, I want you to pay attention to the, find the point when enough is enough. The story we're going to look at comes about a group of people who have just been released from slavery and have been told they're going to the promised land, but instead are finding themselves in the wilderness. And they're realizing or thinking to themselves that when they were in slavery, at least they had food. And now they wondered, is this really better to be free? And they're complaining to their leaders, Moses and Aaron, about this. So hear this story from the book of Exodus. And listen for when enough is enough. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them this, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. And then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And in the evening the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the dew lifted, there on the surface was a flaky substance, such as fine frost on the ground. Now when the Israelites saw this, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread from the Lord that the Lord has given you to eat. And this is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs, an omer to a person, which is about two quarts to a person. And all of you shall provide for those in your tents. So the Israelites did so, and some gathered more and some gathered less. But when they measured it against the Omer, they found that those who had gathered more had just the same as those who had gathered less. God provided for them each as everyone needed. And Moses said to them this, Let no one leave it over until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. And some of them left it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. And morning by morning, they gathered it and as much as they needed, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. And on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as they needed. And all the leaders came together And told Moses, and Moses said to them, Well, this is what the Lord has commanded you to do. Because tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. And all that is left over, put aside to be kept until morning. So they put it aside to be kept as morning. And it did not grow foul. Moses said, Eat it today. For today is a Sabbath to the Lord, and today you will not find it in the field. For six days you shall gather, but on the seventh day you shall rest. On the seventh day, however, 
Some went out to the field to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, in the six days, he gives you food for two days. Each of you stay where you are. Do not leave your place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I'm wondering if you caught it. Did you catch it? The point in the story when enough is enough. Probably one of the points you heard it was in regard to the food, the manna, which is the Hebrew word that translates, what is it? Now, I don't think there's any theological significance to naming a food, what is it? Maybe there is, but I think it's kind of comical that there's a food called, what is it? You know, imagine asking your roommates to maybe toast you not a piece of, you know, Aunt Millie's seven grain or Wonder Bread, but hey, toast me up some what is it. (laughs) Now, given what we talked about last week with food economics in our country, perhaps what is it is a more appropriate name for some of the things we eat. But that's beside the point for today. We see in the gathering of the manna for the Israelites that enough was always enough. When the people gathered more than they needed or less than they needed, everyone somehow ended up with exactly the same amount. Did you catch, however, the other point in the story when enough was enough? The Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments? In essence, enough is enough. When will you listen to me? You see, we are quick to hear this story and think of it simply as a story of God's providence. And yes, indeed, it is a story of God's providence. Hear me clearly. But it's also a story about the people of God. A story about Israel's ability or inability to listen to the commands of God, to God's instruction. Specifically, instruction regarding the Sabbath. Because it is when the Israelites go to gather on the seventh day, after they've been told not to, that God says, when will you listen to my commands? Enough is enough. And it makes me wonder if the God of the Israelites, the God of all creation, our God, is looking down on us and wondering the same thing. I'm not sure what practices come to your mind, if any, when you think of Sabbath or Sabbath keeping. For me, one of the first things I think about is Renee Kolf's trampoline. You see, Renee Kolf was my next-door neighbor growing up, and my siblings and I loved to cut through our backyard fence and jump on the Kolf's trampoline. And this was never really a problem as long as there was an adult within shouting distance. But I remember going over there one Sunday afternoon, knocking on the door, and Mrs. Kolf came to the door, not Renee or one of the um, other kids our age. And I asked if Renee could come out and play or if I could jump on the trampoline. And Mrs. Kolf looked down on me. I have not always been this tall. I was once a little (laughs) child. And she gently and, and quietly reminded me that, Katie, today is a day of rest. Now, I remember being a little bit perplexed as a young child because I really thought to myself, it really doesn't take that much energy to jump on a trampoline. I'm rested. And we had gone to church in the morning, and probably we're going to go again that evening. And this kind of sums up a lot of Sabbath keeping for me growing up. It seemed like kind of an arbitrary list of do's and don'ts. I remember going to my grandparents' house, and you were not allowed to watch TV on Sunday. But you could listen to the radio if the Tigers were playing. (laughs) So, I mean, there was just lots of conflicting messages coming our way. Sabbath, as one author puts it, is best regarded by Christians as one of the Ten Commandments, and at worst, as simply a quaint Jewish custom that is no longer relevant. What Sabbath ought to be understood, though, is an observance of gifts and limits. You see, the word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, 
which literally translates to rest. It does not translate to Sunday. Sabbath is a part of our story from the very beginning, and not simply a part of our story, but it's the very crowning point of of creation. You see God in a delightful twist on the last day of creation. His work is to rest. Rest becomes a verb. That is his action. And the work becomes the noun. And this is the day that God sets apart as holy. This crowning point of creation has quickly lost its centrality in our culture, however. We live in a day where we are defined by what we do. Where one of the things we often do when meeting up with people maybe we haven't seen in a while is to list how busy we have been as a mark of accomplishment or productivity. It's a world that's constantly on the go. We have our earbuds plugged in and our fingers are flying over the keys to send emails and texts. In a lot of our households, family cars are simply becoming taxis that shuttle people between practices and meetings, and the dinner tables are vacant as people's schedules don't allow them to eat together. Norman Weerspa, in his book, Living the Sabbath, says this, rest is not simply about stopping. When we stop from our work, what we're really doing is exhibiting a fundamental trust and faith in the goodness and praiseworthiness of God. Sabbath rest is a call to Sabbath trust, a call to visibly demonstrate in our daily living that we know ourselves to be upheld by the grace of God rather than the strength and craftiness of our own hands. Now, some Christians have argued with the coming of Christ that the Sabbath keeping has been abolished and the new law has been given. We see Christ healing on the Sabbath, and thus we're quick to think that this is a message that we're free to work on the Sabbath. This, however, is an anemic understanding of the new law. See, the new law has come to give fullness of life to everyone, to all of God's creation. It's a reordering of things. And yes, we find in Christ that our salvation does not come from rule-keeping, and thus Sabbath-keeping does not save us, yet our inability to submit to limits is indeed killing us in all of God's creation. Who, if not us, the people of God, will stop to say enough is enough? Now, Sabbath-keeping requires discipline, and it's a discipline that I've been working on in my life over the past couple years, and acutely in this Lent season as well, and it's developed for me um, throughout the years. Um, I have a job where Sunday is not a day of rest that can be a day of rest for me. So I've developed into a rhythm where Thursdays have become my Sabbath, and it start actually on Wednesday evening and kind of end on Thursday evening. And there's no magical list of do's and don'ts, and I'm not saying my Sabbath keeping needs to be your Sabbath keeping. Um, But one thing that I have found um, that I've done that's been helpful is I've created a list of things that are life-giving to me that I do not take the time to do. And I have all sorts of reasons as to why not. Those are the things I do on my Sabbath. Sometimes I don't do much, but it's hard work to rest. It's hard work to unplug It takes discipline to turn off your phone and to stay off the computer. And it's work for me to not defend it to others, that somehow I need to justify taking this rest. What would it look like for us if ours were were, where we were a culture where rather than proving ourselves as competent, industrious, or productive by rattling off how busy our lives were, that we encouraged one another to rest in the rhythms that God has set for us, where we delighted with one another over slow-cooked meals, leisurely walks through creation, handwritten notes. And rather than being suspicious or jealous of those who rest well and think, must be nice when a friend comments on having the day off or taking a vacation, but we encouraged one another to set good boundaries with our computers and our cell phones And we rejoiced with one another as we were pulled into these rhythms. And you may say, I can't take a whole day off to rest. That's fine. Hopefully what you're seeing is Sabbath-keeping is more about a way of living, 
a way of being. If you are in a place where you can take a day, great. If you're not, remember it's not a list about do's and don'ts, but about limits and understanding gifts and responses to that. Maybe for you, Sabbath keeping simply means that when you agree to do something else and add it to your calendar, you first take something out. Maybe it means scheduling your day so there's more margins between times so you can walk and not drive to places. Maybe it means having a day where you turn off your phone. Maybe it means simply setting limits to when you will do homework, of trusting that enough is enough. Ultimately, what Sabbath keeping does is draws us into the present moment and helps us to pay attention to God, to God's provision and to God's presence in our life, and to remind us and one another that enough is simply enough. Let's pray. God, thank you for rhythms. Thank you for creation. And thank you for setting things right again through Christ. Help us have eyes to see and hearts and minds to understand this new way of living. And then, God, give us the feet and the hands to walk into this way and to work into this way. And may we do so as the body of Christ. We pray this all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.